off sunning himself somewhere in the Red Sea. Um, yes. I'm not sure what the quality of the water is right now, but yeah. that's a joke between me and Connor. But, you know, we're looking forward to uh, giving you some gems of information tonight. Um, so down below me on my left, down there, is oh. Karen Reed, our special guest. <laughs> Hi, Karen. Hi, and down on my right is Connor. Uh, Connor is there. So he's with us yep. uh, as always. Um, so, guys, um, we hope you're going to enjoy tonight lots of information, maybe a bit more clinical tonight uh, than necessarily nutrition, but believe it or not, Karen's going to give us some nutritional uh, benefits of um, how to feed a long-term dog uh, with this problem, uh, a raw diet. So uh, hopefully we'll get a good rounded uh, figure. So actually, do you know what I'm going to do? Just because I always know what Connor's going to talk about. So I'm going to ask Karen, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, how, uh, what have you been doing this week? Come on, what's your thing of the week? My thing of the week, um, I just do lots of work for Connor. That's all I do. All my finest work is Aaron, to be Basically, <laughs> basically Connor's done nothing. I've just done all the work so far this week. Actually, I'm going to go through the list of things that people that work behind Connor and produces excellent <laughs> dogs first IE website and rewrites it yeah. from well, his... <laughs> That's that is exactly, exactly it. Yes, yeah. that's exactly uh, all I, I do. That's all I do. <laughs> you are you're you're just mad into canine nutrition. Like it's it's it it just uh just like when you you just it moves like is that the word? What's the word where you just absolutely like when you're talking to somebody about dogs, yeah. like you, you've been working with dogs like all your life really, you know, and then you've yeah, you, you canine nutrition stuff, which is why Karen and myself have been working together on trying to get the dog's first uh, site back up and running, which requires going back over articles and getting the latest signs of the last 10 years and looking at what I wrote and vomited out 10 years ago and saying, okay, we need to bring up some speed and whatnot. And uh, so that's that's what Karen's been doing, but it's, uh, it's been brilliant. So welcome on, Kara. We're going to appreciate your insight on this because you are very present in all the uh, laryngeal paralysis groups. And uh, this is something that's very close to your heart. As you can see, uh, Lord Newton is there behind you, hanging up on the wall. And uh, yeah. that's the boss. So we can't wait to hear about this 15-year-old dog still doing zoomies and giving everybody great hope. Um, before we start on laryngeal paralysis, uh, we, we are at patreon.com forward slash raw pet medics. We've got all the Nick's holidays pictures and we'll pop them up there at the end of the show. So uh, quick, get in your <laughs> get in your patronage now so you can see that. I don't know if that's good for business or bad. Um, so, um, but listen, before we talk about this uh, particular subject, I just want to touch on something that I posted up during the week, Brent. Uh, it yeah. was about... Um, uh, a, a veterinary clinic over in the US and they had written on the bottom as a general intake sheet for dogs and at the bottom they said there's going to be a 25 book surcharge for uh, raw fed dogs and look you could we, we don't need to kind of get into the whole like listen that's just so obviously ridiculous how do you filter out your raw your cats eating prey and all this nonsense it's like it's so, so ridiculous and the the safety would be on the side of raw in my opinion although supported by the the data that we have but like, have you, what's your opinion on that? What do you think about a surcharge? As a guy who ran an extremely busy veterinary clinic, what, like, what about that? Isn't that ridiculous? Still do. Yeah, still do. Just still come, do. Sorry, come ben, fresh sorry. from work. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, 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 this yeah, is retired do, me already. I just like... <laughs> this in the beard. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, from, look, do you know what? I look at this and think, if you're managing an inpatient in a hospital situation, Surely, surely to God, you're going to be doing that in a clinical manner with gloves, you know, some PPE of some description so yeah. that you don't get covered in all sorts of stuff and then move to the next patient and handle them with the same sort of all over you. Yeah. I, I, I am gobsmacked that anybody is putting a surcharge on top of that for an individual raw because, you know, if they're handling inpatients properly you'd think yeah. that they're going to be sterile between you know, yeah so, uh, i do not see any kennels of worth with people with drinks and food and you know doing you know just happen to be sitting down amongst the patients while they're eating their lunch uh, that is not 
what modern veterinary medicine is about. Yeah. And, you know, realistically, you know, them talking about putting surcharges on for that sort of stuff is, yeah, it, it smacks a little bit of just trying to make a bit of extra money from yeah, whatever. Or possibly, and that's yeah. not there. Possibly industry owned. I mean, Mars have two thousand uh, veterinary hospitals, more than fifty thousand vets on the payroll, or they own all the diagnostics. So you could easily have a clinic that is perhaps Mars owned. Uh, I know that sounds very dark, and we are co- touching uh, very close to uh, getting in trouble. But um, there, there, is, <laughs> there is allusions to that. When, when, when a post- chocolate a, factory owned, a number, yeah, a number, <laughs> yeah, a certain chocolate manufacturer. But um, uh, the, a lot of people posted up that it's happening in the UK. So there's uh, two or three people that are probably be on here tonight, and they said this actually happened in the in the UK as well. And um, so, do you remember there was back in the day there was. Um, words from on high to say to segregate raw fed dogs did that did that ever come into practice yeah, certain, certainly there were certain veterinary colleges okay or you know the universities that train vets that had some of their professors getting a little bit antsy about people feeding raw for no particular reason other than pure bias and, and hey presto you know, it just happened that their departments were being, you know, provided for by some of those well-known brands of uh, foods uh, that aren't yeah. fresh. Um, yeah. And therefore, you know, it, it sort of did smack a little bit of, you know, who's put you up to this? You know, where's your science? You're actually just doing it from an, uh, a personal bias rather yeah. than um, yeah. any evidence out there. And we're still yeah. battling that, you know, this proposed possibility of a faintest thing and if you want to know more about that if you look back to february's uh, podcast you'll see us talking on harping on about bacteria and, and that side of things because yeah. you know at the moment it just seems to be absolute bunkum that we're getting yeah. you know a, a storm about uh, and you know we're still not seeing the evidence there's there's still too many papers out there propositioning that this is how they perceive um yeah. that sort of impression has got and as connor beautifully said on that night you know far more um food poisonings come from raw carrots than probably come from any sort of meat uh yeah. so i think we need to be really taking it with a pinch of salt yeah nikki kamak study there from uh, from new jersey and uh, helsinki study Sixteen thousand people part of that study i mean it, and incredibly safe was the response i mean if you tested a household asking about food poisoning incidents in the household the figures would be way higher one in seven americans are getting food poisoning uh you know en- enormous amounts of reporting to hospital with salmonella from the food they're eating is this a reason not to eat fresh food oh, anyway look, we've, we've killed that point a number of times do we, should we get straight into uh, laryngeal paralysis? Who wants to? I think, Brent, do you want to tell us a little bit about laryngeal paralysis? What is it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Tell, uh, tell me what it is. Okay. Okay. So, um, look, you know, as we named it tonight, you know, it's a little bit of uh, cough, splutter, and choke. Um, this is really for those people that have had uh, a pet, maybe cat or dog, um, that has probably. Um, suffered a chronic cough with no temperature, no particular sort of um, chest issues, um, seems to come from the upper respiratory area. So we're talking uh, around the throat, but there's no soreness of the throat. And as I say, no temperature. They're not down in the dumps particularly, uh, but they come in with this, this change in cough. And actually, sometimes until the vets actually ask the question people don't always perceive actually yes the bark has changed or the meow has gone okay uh and they do more of a silent like that because you couldn't hear that could you so you know it's just a tiny little bit of a squeak okay or the the bark has gone from a deep roof to a more of a sort of noise um and those are sort of like alarm bell signs that actually there is something else that could be going on and i'm going to try and do a little bit of a a demo for those people that know a little bit about anatomy but don't necessarily know what's going on on the the back of the throat so i'm going to stand for this just so you've got a background okay and we're going to see if this works Uh, so here we go demo so what i love to do is show clients this okay so my two fingers here is effectively the la- the uh, 
epiglottis. And that normally closes over um, when they're swallowing food just to protect the larynx, okay? The secondary thing that happens is these two fingers here are your vocal cords, okay? And what we call the retinoid cartilages control that and actually will open that when they want to breathe louder, uh, okay, breathe, sorry, harder, or they'll close, especially if there's food sensed in that area or mucus, and they'll actually snap shut to protect food from going down the windpipe. So behind here is the windpipe, okay? And what we actually get is when we've got a nerve, usually the right recurrent laryngeal nerve, um, damaged, then this starts to flap. So we'll get withdrawal of one side and we'll get flapping around of um, the uh, larynx at the back there. And that is what's causing that weird rough noise. They can't create a nice tight vocal singing voice. It is just literally flapping around. If it's really severe, both nerves can get damaged and you then just sort of like all of this. And that's when we can actually do some surgery to tie those back so they're permanently open. But then, as we're going to talk to Karen about, we've got to manage that process of what, how we feed them because there's no longer protection of snapping shut to protect food going down the airway. OK, so mm -hmm. I hope that's clear. I hope, yeah, yeah, it's really clear. Connor, Connor's looking at it going with I a frowny face. I just... Yeah, no, that's my, that's my concentrating face. People always say I look this <laughs> when I'm studying. But no, that's my... Uh, that's my that's when he's on the loo and he's concentrating. <laughs> yeah, my, my resting bitch face is what my wife calls it. But anyway. Um... So, so that's really what we're dealing with, okay? And we've got to look at that. And we can see that sometimes when we... Um, have them sedated and look down the back of their throats and we can actually still see whether the larynx can move under sedation or not. Uh, so that's a, a diagnostic tool, okay? okay. So um, hopefully that gives you a little bit of an outline and that can happen definitely in uh, cats, but also most commonly in dogs. And there are certain breeds, certainly the Labradors, the Retrievers, quite a few of the larger breeds, and we're going to talk about why that might be uh, soon, um, that, that will get this problem usually later in life. So, you know, especially if we're seeing a dog around 10 years old uh, and we start to get that, then that's something to look at. Another sort of um, area that sort of crops to mind, if your dog rolls on its back, okay, and is, you know, playing around and then all of a sudden it gets this <laughs> And, and choke, okay? That can often be just because of the saliva and the stuff going down, but they can't stop it going down the airway. So they actually do a whole hack cough to try oh. and get it out, okay? Bloody and hell. sometimes quite an ineffectual cough. You know, it'll be, they'll make a right deal of it because they just can't snap that larynx right. shut and then produce the pressure to then cough it out. Yeah, okay. I hear I hear a lot about I hear a lot just to kill this off straight away. I, I heard there's different grades of this, so it can be you can have like a, a you know level one, two, three, four, and uh, what about mega esophagus? Is that the same disease as laryngeal paralysis? Is that like level five laryngeal paralysis where the thing is just a straight shoot down and there's just is that what mega esophagus is? Just tell what's the difference between those two? Okay, so megaesophagus is really paresis and paralysis of the food pipe going through the chest. So you're building up food within the food pipe. Okay, paresis is a weakness. So you talked about grading. Okay, so we can have a weakness in that nerve that is not communicating correctly through to whatever um, area. So the esophagus in the in megaesophagus, uh, which is the food pipe, or to the larynx in you know the the laryngeal paresis. Okay, is where the vocal cords can still They'll move they just can't do it as well as they were so it's uh it's not fully paralyzed they're still doing something uh to move it but ultimately that can become something where it just becomes totally flaccid okay okay and of a second question why is it that this disease is often related to weakness in the hind limbs and a bit of neuropathy and that kind of stuff what's the link between those two things OK, so really interesting. Uh, and this comes back to why I think the primary cause is trauma, usually from um, an inappropriate accident on the lead. So that could be um, it, 
you know, yes, there are lots of other traumas, you know, surgery to the neck, um, you know, hitting a tree at speed, um, you know, because there's some dog, daft dogs out there that do that, um, or even hitting the owner's legs just behind the knee at speed um, could be one of them. Uh, but, you know, hit, being hit by another dog. But we all know, we've all seen those people out there on the park where the dog has hurtled off on a um, extendable lead and it's come to the end of the lead. Before you know it, the owner does not let go of that lead. They hold on to it and the dog goes oh, like that. Or those unfortunate um, trainers or, or owners that have been taught to train by using a check chain. OK, so a check chain or a pronged collar, not not something that's legal in the UK, but certainly uh, we do see prong collars um, around the world, especially in the US and Canada. Um, they are something that's there and they are taught to do that as a sudden, you know, to check them from moving forward. It's not supposed to be a choke chain of actually holding on to it and throttling them, but a yeah. check chain, which is a smart, what, you know. What, you know about the, what about the slip lead that the breeders use that, um, I say breeders in shows, I'm not picking on the breeders here, but the slip lead just goes up underneath the chin, do you know? Yeah, so you see, like, yeah, you see the sort of gun dog, but when they're doing that, the they've, often, they've often taught those dogs to walk to heel appropriately and i would always say you know for me and you're a behaviorist uh, and you've had some you know uh, influence on uh, training organizations in the past and i would just say you know my personal uh, feeling is if you want to and karen actually you can come in on this because you've done a lot of um, work with dogs and walking and and things like that you're probably experienced as well uh, but my personal feeling um, is that if you're training a your dog to, lead, to to heal, then as soon as the dog gets in front of you, you change direction. They very quickly will follow you, okay? Um, you know, rather than allowing them to pull. Um, and actually, all I need to do is put my foot down hard now on the ground, um, and my spaniel immediately knows that I'm probably going to change direction and comes back to heal. So I don't even need to change direction. It literally is just that slap on the tarmac with my foot and she's back. So she are, are, are you talking about damage to the neck? Because when I asked about neuropathy, are you talking about damages to nerves now? Is that where you think that weakness is in the hind Yeah, so now the, the interesting thing is if you think of the uh, spinal cord, okay, the vertebrae uh, like this, okay, and above that is the, the, the actual bit that holds the cord and below is the vertebral bodies and nerves come out here, okay, either side. Actually, the nerves that feed the back legs are actually running along the bottom of the spine. So actually, if there's any damage to any of the discs within this area, not only does those discs impinge the nerves coming out in the neck that can affect, especially around the lower neck area, into that larynx, and it's the recurrent laryngeal because it comes out and back up the neck, okay? Also, what can happen is that the bulging disc can impinge on the nerves that feed through to the back legs. So it could still be a physical trauma that is leading to those sort of neuropathies. There is something really interesting that we touched on before the show, which is also about the um, issues of some of the toxins, some of the neurotoxins that we can find in some foods. The aflatoxins, for instance, can affect the nerves. So they could cause general neuropathies. Uh, and we talk about that in, you've got a really great study, the, the thing about the megrosophagus um, yeah. uh, and those those things. But the you know it, it could be that that is also an influence. But I would expect yeah. raw food feeders should not experience it at all if it was all yeah. down to that. Yeah. What about Newton? Did Newton get any of that, Karen? Yeah, I mean, we got, uh, Newton came to us at 15 months old. We adopted him. And before he came to us, he, he would have had some pretty harsh um, uh, old school training, like Brendan was saying, with the check-in. Um, and he actually came to us with a bit of a weird cough. And at the time, the vet said he had kennel cough. So got him over that. And it never really seemed to go away. So we were kind of used to Newton always having this weird little cough. When he got excited, like you said, Brent, if he laid on his back, he'd all get up and cough. But it never bothered him. He never, he's always been crazy, running, no exercise intolerance. But I was always aware of laryngeal paralysis, just always worked with dogs. Every time I went to the vet, which wasn't very often, it would be, just check his throat for laryngeal paralysis. No, no, it's not that. It's probably a bit of a weakness from the kennel cough. So They didn't check. They wouldn't check when you asked them to check. 
No. no, I mean, it's when they're young, they're kind of, it's, they, they will check his throat and as soon as they touch his throat, he'll cough. So they were always, they were always aware that it could be laryngeal paralysis, but it wasn't like it was affecting his life. He wasn't coughing all the time. So it was always yeah. on our radar um, because just he'd always had this cough. Um, but it was only when he got to about 12 that um, his bark did change slightly and he got a bit of hind leg weakness, as you were just saying about. But at 12, you kind of start to think, is it a bit of arthritis setting in? So you don't really take yeah. a lot of notice. He, he was having hard therapy, no, fine. And then what happened with Newton was he we went out for a walk one day and he went in the water, having a great time as usual, no problems got out of the water and started coughing, started gagging. Then it came more distressed and thought, this isn't right. And he was coughing more, coughing more. Then he was struggling to breathe. Then he just collapsed. So we, we were out on a walk about a mile from our van. No. So, yeah, he's on the on his side, completely collapsed. Um, and I just thought, went over, pulled his tongue out, thought he's eating something in the water. So checked his throat, nothing, and checked his heart. And his heart also stopped, which is fun. Because Newton, Newton has to have added drama. Newton can't just do things. Oh, like absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so Full maximum drama. <laughs> so immediately, like, see my husband's on the phone. I started CPR on him. Cause luckily, I knew how to do it. Wow. So we that, got him back. Tart started again. We just had to carry him for about a mile to the van. Had to keep stopping because his tongue was blue. He was gone. Pumping his heart again. Kept trying to pull his tongue out. No idea. At that point, we thought it was his heart. So finally got to the... Um, but long story short, he had a scope a couple of weeks later and he had severe bilateral laryngeal paralysis. So what happened to him is they just shut and they didn't open because he was literally, there was no air. Wow. Oh, my God. So he's were that bad that even, and after that, if because I'm sure Brendan will say, like in warmer weather, that's when laryngeal paralysis dogs will suffer more because they're panting more. They can't regulate their temperatures because they can't get enough oxygen in. So it was unfortunately this was in june and it was becoming hot and his surgery ended up being an emergency because he had another breathing crisis um and collapsed in the van on the way to the hospital which was fun um, and took straight in an oxygen chamber and four days later he had to tie back and has been amazing ever since like literally and is this, is this the surgery where they tie Tie back both sides then when you say bilateral does that mean both sides have to be tied no, back he's what, just got to be what newton had um newton Newton had his left side tied back and our surgeon was amazing and she tied, tries to tie back as little as she can so the hole is as small as possible. So the if the fold can't shut anymore to cause, cause a breathing crisis, but it's also not big enough that food can go down. I mean, I still have to be super careful how he eats because of aspirating and stuff. But, um, yeah, she's, she did an amazing job. So only one side is tied back. So this is why when he goes out and he pants you'll still hear a bit of what they call a strider so he, when he breathes a little bit because the other side is still flapping around but obviously he's not at risk of having that breathing crisis like he did yeah. because he's got an open airway now so um he That's literally incredible. i remember at rest i remember doing his breathing rate his respiratory rate at rest um the few nights before his surgery and it was 40 43 breaths per minute that was at rest he hadn't been doing anything and literally the day he came home from surgery, it was 10. So that's wow. how much he was struggling wow. to breathe. Yeah, that's so it was, it, yeah, literally uh, mad. Uh, and I, I, I just want to point out two things to all of those guys out there as well. One is brilliant that you uh, have the understanding to do the CPR. I think mm -hmm. I'd encourage far more owners yeah. to take on board some of those first aid courses that teach them how to do CPR um, for pets. Yeah. OK. Um, and, you know, brilliant. Well done. I mean, you know, gobsmackingly that you've managed to do that, because um, even with CPR, without any of the other adjunctive um stuff such as the, the sh ability to shock the heart and things like that, you know, actually only five percent of cases. That's right five percent of cases mm. will recover with cpr from a stopped heart okay so wow. that's so even though it's something that's taught on those um first aid courses you know reiterate you know you do need to be pretty close and pretty on it to to get them to wow. recover like that one in 20 so, shot karen mm. that is some what a job yeah. you did and multiple times yeah, absolutely Every time brilliant i mean Absolutely, brilliant. You wanted to say and it's it's weird because 
we thought he did have a heart problem, but once he had his op about two months after his heart was completely back to normal, yeah. and the vet said it was purely because he wasn't getting enough oxygen. I mean, he had yeah. um, muscle wastage in his back legs about four months after the surgery. Muscle just came back because he was getting the right oxygen. Yeah. Um, obviously, yeah. I don't want to scare anybody who's watching this because not every dog will go into a breathing crisis. But yeah. I think it was difficult for us because Newton had always had a little cough. So nothing was different to us. But if you start noticing your dog gets an abnormal cough and it's it's really a honking cough and a gag. They gag a lot, um, yeah. especially on excitement and stuff. That's what I say. He'd always done it. So it's really hard for us. And it it progressed so, so quickly with him soon as the warm weather started he just it literally well I say he just out of the blue just collapsed we just yeah had no idea it was that bad did, and where did you get your cpr training where did you get yours i did it um years ago when i did my canine nutrition diploma part of it was health and like first aid as well um and being a dog walker for 11 years i just made a point of learning everything i could because your dogs will catch you out all the time so um yeah. yeah that was i'm so glad i did and like you said bren anyone should learn that it's that's got yeah. a dog because he wouldn't be here if yeah. if we didn't do that so i mean a heads um, up to rachel bean who i know is a veterinary nurse has done them sort of nationwide and has done quite a lot there are a few nurses out there doing those uh courses now yeah. uh, we as a practice also have a nurse that does those uh um emergency and uh um first aid courses for pet owners uh, so there are lots of places maybe contact your local practice and just double check whether they've got a course um, uh, and then also look online I'm sure there's plenty of you put in animal uh, first aid uh, there'll, there'll be courses near you Is around that, the world because it doesn't it's yeah. not just the UK you know there's uh, people over in America um, Canada and uh, yeah, so one, Australia. The, there's one in Ireland here, uh, Canine First Aid, one by Jenny Hale and Karina Kerrigan, uh, just to give them a plug. Uh, check it out, caninefirstaid.e. They're very good as well. Um, but even a YouTube video, guys, is better than nothing. They say any CPR is better than no CPR. Um, yeah. So, but li listen to this, guys. Listen to the prevalence of laryngeal uh, paralysis in dogs. This is a bit scary. Much like pancreatitis, when you look under the hood, you find an awful lot of it. Two thirds of healthy cats and dogs with some degree of it by mid age. Listen to this about uh, laryngeal paralysis. This is the results of studies of 250 uh, otherwise non laryngeal paralysis dogs who turned up on the veterinary table and they had a look at them. And 25% of the dogs examined had some degree of laryngeal uh, paralysis. Affected dogs were, or paralysis. Affected dogs were significantly older than uh, unaffected dogs. There was a trend for the severity to increase in age. No di difference between sexes. Um, overweight animals had a significantly higher grade than those with a normal conditional score. Labs, Rottweilers, Setters, most likely affected. I just thought, wow, when they look, there's an awful lot of this going on, which kind of does reinforce um, the, the physical kind of trauma, physical damage bit of it, or some other common factor across all these breeds. Um, uh, that is bloody scary. The natural thing that comes into this is that, right, you've now got an open food pipe, open uh, windpipe, and we do not want any water uh, or food. A little bit of water probably wouldn't be the end of the world. I see some of the top people in this where the dogs are running through the water. I see Newton's 15 years old now, guys, and he's a big lab. He's not a small lab lean and uh, just a perfect looking lab but he's running around in the waters but i would be more worried about food how do you work the food side of things Karen? well basically our surgeon said to us that um whenever a dog with lp eats you need to make sure the food's as smooth as possible okay. so even if you feed kibble a lot of people on there's a fantastic group if anyone's watching the laryngeal paralysis support group on facebook they are so amazing such good help well such a help for me um, and a lot of people on their feed kibble and they will soak the kibble and just make sure it's in a, a really smooth ball. Obviously, depending on the size of your dog, like a golf ball for Newton size. Um, but obviously, Newton's on raw. So you need to just make sure the food's as smooth as possible. No dust, no sort of fatty liquids. So if you feed like tins of food in gravy, you probably want to uh, avoid the gravy somehow. Because obviously, if any of that sort of fatty or liquid gets into the lung, that's when bacteria is going to start to, like you say, the water isn't usually a huge problem because they will cough like newton if he has a drink sometimes will just cough any water up that goes down okay and obviously our surgeon said it's a good thing if they do cough after a drink because they're not it's not going down the wrong hole so but yeah no dust no sort of bits and the most important thing is which newton's really happy with is they just have to swallow it whole 
So yeah. no, no sort of chewing or crunching bits. Like you can't have you can't have bones anymore. Sadly, uh. I know a lot of dogs after the op do, but Newton has always tried to swallow bones, however big they are. He just wants yeah. to get them down him. So I tried it a couple of times and literally was pulling them out of his throat. So yeah. <laughs> it was too terrifying. And he has marrow bones because he's always been good eating them. He never bites down, so he just really so that's kind of for his teeth clean and eating really enjoys them but anything even things like these sort of the bully sticks he'll just try and swallow them so i can't let him have anything like that now but um yeah just the food needs to be smooth needs to be in a bowl so they can just literally swallow it so whatever you sort of feed that's the best way um to do it and there's a there's dispute really with whether to raise bowls i've never really done it with newton i mean just where we live now it, they want to step anyway so they are raised but um there's, our surgeon didn't seem to think you needed to raise food bowls or water yeah. bowls. But if you've got a dog, again, it's so different for every dog, but if you've got a dog that just, you know, some especially labs, they'll just inhale water. They just stick their head in and it... Holds it, it out with their nose. Yeah, and... yeah. yeah. Newton's yeah. never done that. He's always been quite gentle with it. I think it's the part of the golden retriever in him. It's a bit more uh, yeah. sort of gentle. But um, if you've got a lab that literally inhales water, you might want to get one of those slow down bowls, you know, the ones with the, that stops the level of like the water coming out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically it really. And when, when he came home, I hand fed him for about six weeks, um, which is fun because I'm a veggie. <laughs> so rolling yeah. meat into yeah. the hand. Yeah. Actually, tripe. tripe was really <laughs> oh. fun. You so, don't want to be playing with that. That's the no. worst me to be playing with. That is just... So, oh yeah, it God. was basically how I did it. I rolled it up and I would... It's almost like I stuffed it in his mouth so he yeah. literally swallowed it. He was loving life. I think yeah. he was happy anything. <laughs> but, um, and I found with Newton and what a lot of um, LP... Like dogs with LP, uh, the owners find, is to feed them little and often. So, yeah. again, Newton's loving life because about every three hours he has, like, a few meatballs. So, yeah. um, again... <laughs> he's yeah. just... He's, it's, it started at three hours and in lockdown it was like every two hours it was like where's yeah. food so now it's like <laughs> yeah. every two hours yeah so uh, so yeah that's just something personally oh, i do and i know a lot of, of people do with dogs of yeah. lp just because again brendan could probably touch on this a bit i don't know but a lot of lp dogs also seem to suffer with reflux and issues like that yeah and i don't know I, i'm obsessed with the vagus nerve and i know that that innovates a lot of that area and obviously it goes into the gut so i don't know if that um, I'm always trying to look into more about that because it seems that uh, most LP dogs seem to have issues with motility and reflux. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's the reflux a lot of the time because the bile comes up that can go into the lung and then causes aspiration pneumonia. So yeah. trying to get on top of that reflux is such a battle for a lot. I'm quite lucky with Newton, but he did have it when he first came back from his op. But the amount of drugs he was on, again, going to the nutrition, I needed to heal his gut. So mm. he did probiotics all the stuff you do and yeah. I'm really lucky now that he doesn't if he has some meat sometimes with a bit too much bone in he, he'll be burping and I can smell it I smell a bile straight away smell in his breath wow so yeah. I know he needs something yeah um, so, and this, this yeah. fits that group of diseases that also occur from where those um, parasympathetic nerves come out of the lower um, cervical spine, so the lower part of the neck, um, including Horner's syndrome, which also comes in there where they get an unequal um, pupil size. And we'll do another live about that uh, just so that people know what Horner's syndrome and the different things are with that. Um, uh, but including uh you know back to the megasophagus stuff and you know uh, how the cardiac sphincter of the stomach closes uh, on and opens properly um so again if you've got links and it depends on the level of trauma um in that area and, and some of those breeds interestingly um you can get those that are predisposed to wobblers syndrome and that's where those parts of the vertebrae that are down at that end of the neck aren't actually in line so they they actually have a slight kink uh in the uh vertebral space which means that there's an impingement on those nerves now we call them wobblers because usually they back leg wobble okay mm -hmm. but actually all of the nerve outflows will also be affected so that's why some of those like the setters particularly uh, can also be affected with this yeah. something that's interesting i've seen a few people talk about their dogs have been in for operations and had some issues and there is some damage that can occur inadvertently from the cuffs of tubes being blown up 
too high so they you know effectively it can cause some irritation and inflammation and then resultant collapse of the cartilage um, in the throat and that can give a very similar appearance and quite a lot of um, short brachycephalic um, dogs so that's the short nosed dogs uh, like the pugs etc that again um, can and, and there's another the Norfolk Terrier is a, a classic um, that can suffer from a collapsed trachea a long um, soft palate and actually a weakness in the cartilages around here so there's a little bit of things of working out whether it's a primary paresis or paralysis or a secondary due to other pathology that's going on in that area. Um, so really interesting to hear what about, Karen's um, uh, experience with this. What about other treatments, guys? So like, um, you, you know, first of all, is there any drugs or natural treatments that can ease uh, these guys' sufferings? And the second one is chiropractory acupuncture. What about those two? If it's a nerve thing, why wouldn't a little sort it out? Um, the only thing, the only thing, the only thing I have to just do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's better. That's what we're after. Yeah. Um, the only thing I saw, I think it was last year or the year before, Nick did a jaw jaw with um, a group of people, and Tony Nevin was on there, and he's an osteopath, an animal osteopath and human, I do believe. And he absolutely shocked me and Nick because he said that if he get I asked a question about laryngeal paralysis because Newton does suffer with the polyneuropathy side. He's got a weird misfiring of nerves where he thinks if you touch certain part of his body, he thinks his ear is itching. And I mean, it's quite funny, bless him. But yeah, and he's got a bit of a nerve in his leg that kicks off like this and it will make him fall. And he's got sort of ataxia and it all comes from this misfiring of nerves. Mm. He's got a physio in certain places you touch him. Something else will kick off somewhere else. And um, Tony Nevin was saying that... Um, if you get if he gets dogs coming to him early enough, so if you just get that little that when they start coughing or maybe their bark changes, if they come into him, he's actually the cases he's managed to um, cure. It was like 50-50. He like literally said that he can work so much on the throat and they, like Brendan saying the back of the neck where there's maybe trauma to the spine and all that nerve issue. He said like dogs haven't actually had gone on to have surgery because he's been able to ease the symptoms if he gets them early enough. I mean, Newton was wow. far too late by the time he's collapsing. Wow. But I, it was just a stat. I'd, I'd never heard that before. I didn't think there was anything you could do other than surgery, as Nick was sort of shocked as well. Yeah. You know, that's I remember, what... I remember and, speaking and... to a, a chiropractor, a, a type of chiropractor, I can't remember who calls himself, but uh, he was saying that... Uh, we carry these traumas for years before the actual disease will manifest from the whatever issue. So he says, take, for example, a difficult birth. A baby can go through a very difficult birth and be left with a few kinks here and there. You can be, you play sports like a lunatic when you're like six, seven, eight, 10, 15 years old, just getting into rugby and that kind of things. You take terrible hits, but you get over because your body's so malleable, but you carry that kink for ages and your, your, your muscles are able to hold your spine straight. But as you get older, things just start to go, oh, geez, I can't hold this anymore. And suddenly issues issues recurring ear conditions and babies recurring gastro issues and babies later on in life and i'm like oh my god i can't believe that can be traced back and he goes what's well, that with other damage he said but getting them really young so all his when you're in, in his clinic and, and getting a bit of treatment uh any zero to 15 year olds can walk in for free treatment and they'll just lie up in the bed and he'll just go in five or ten minutes because he's so obsessed about getting it right and he said i don't need to see them again mm -hmm. we pay all his bills because we need to see him all the time i don't personally it was just after a couple of things but um but yeah the kids he says oh you just you won't see them again now he says get them early and just fix it and then that's it and they're gone i know nothing about this end of things but i had faith in it when he told me that and he was such a good guy i just thought wow that's that's good yeah. what about acupuncture karen does that ever offer you? is that a is that a thing that's been uh, uh, that's certainly been suggested to me because of more of his polyneuropathy issues so more of the sort of nerve issues that he has um we're very lucky with him it doesn't seem to have a lot of hind leg weakness there's with him i don't think he, there's a lot of feeling in his back end because sometimes he'll be going to the toilet and he won't kind of realize and then he kind of does and panic oh, so i think there's definitely a loss yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. there's definitely a loss of sensation there and you, i never used to be able to touch his back feet but i can now and he doesn't realize i'm touching them uh, yeah okay. i mean you see you've seen his zoomies he's, he's yeah. still strong i think that's what helps yeah. us and i think that's the diet being strong yeah. in his muscles that help him and being lean as well is so important for these dogs yeah. because like i said even though he's had the op he's still got one side that is faulty so i still need to be really careful keeping him nice and lean so he's not big so he's not struggling to breathe i can't yeah. go out with him in hot weather and stuff yeah. like that still because i still have to be super careful but yeah. um yeah he definitely there's been suggested to me about acupuncture but i don't i think it will stress him out he wouldn't 
He's yeah. really I'm, good with his yeah. the lady that does his canine massage. Is he loves that, but I I don't know how much he mm. would do he that. No, he wouldn't know. His back end is covered in them. Like, this oh. is yeah. true. I think there are <laughs> there are a, a couple of things there. You know, I I always group acupuncture, chiropractic, osteopathy, uh, myofascial release. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, Newton has uh, that light, Newton light has massage, that. is it? Yeah, but yeah. no, uh, my facial release is is slightly different again. And actually, yeah, there's some cupping stuff that can be done, which is actually strange. It's not pressure in; it's it's taking and releasing um, uh, the skin from the underlying fascia, uh, and yeah, all sorts of benefits there. But you can, if you're ever worried about acupuncture and placing needles in your dog because you might think they're needle shy you know there are options with uh, laser therapy um, there's lots of people with k lasers now i see somebody's mentioned about red light therapy um, you know certainly i tend to find that red light therapy gives a shorter relief for some of those issues but they're not sort of as long-lived as some of the laser would give but certainly uh, moving on to acupuncture I think is is there so lots of options in those there are some herbs and things like that St John's wort um, we know for you know keeping ourselves from getting depressed it has some yeah. other neurological um, effects um, that's also found in in remedies like hypericum um, yeah. is made from that okay so uh, understanding um, the use Use of hypericum. Lathyris is also uh, one that's used uh, for uh, that, that sort of uh, laryngeal paresis and, and singular muscular sort of paralysis areas as well. So can, you know, if you've got certain muscle groups that have thinned down uh, for no other apparent reason, you know, it can be really useful. So there are some things out there. Um, definitely the before we... Is there no is there no drugs? I saw there was a new one that came out and uh, the doxepin or whatever it called, but the, the latest study was uh, no, not very effective. Uh, but is there not like uh, things that can help? <laughs> It's like anti-inflammatories and whatnot. Uh, no, what most, most people will use an anti-inflammatory. They'll try and just affect what's going on uh, for any nerve outflow. So any impingement that may be aggravated by inflammation, uh, they may use uh, those, may even give steroids, okay, just yeah, to try and see steroids. if they'll ease them off. Yeah. Uh, obviously, there are very occasional ones that may be down to immune-mediated disease, which is attacking those nerves and causing the polyneuropathy. Um but again, uh, I think there's limited effect in, in many of these cases uh, for those anti-inflammatories uh, of any description. No, that's sad to hear. So uh, I think one thing that I do, you know, Karen touched on earlier, and I think it's really important as we're getting, uh, you know, sort of close to, uh, to our time. It's one of the reasons I mentioned about summer is coming and this is a really important condition for this, is uh, exactly how the airflow is affected and therefore the dog's ability to cool themselves down is affected by this condition, okay? Mm -hmm. As soon as you get one side, um, you know, either tied back, as in Karen's, uh, you know, uh, dog with Newton, or, or you've got just a paresis going on and you've got a flaccid, um, vocal cord flapping away it diverts the airstream away from going directly over the tongue okay uh, to going off to one side yeah. and therefore they're not as efficient yeah. at cooling themselves down yeah. so please 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 guys remember walk your dogs early in the morning or late at night you know dusk mm, and dawn nice. stuff don't walk them in the, the heat of the day number of dogs that have come in with laryngeal paresis or laryngeal issues so the bulldogs etc that cannot breathe properly over their tongues that will come in with heat stroke in the yeah. summertime because people insist on going out in the middle of the day have a picnic take the dog let it run yeah. around like a lunatic and before you know it they're in with heat stroke yeah somebody somebody posted up there a slippery elm for the for the acid reflux i'd actually reach for german chamomile because the studies behind that and it shows it absolutely works uh, we've got decent kind of um response for acid reflux and using german chamomile so that would be my definite go-to but i'm sure also have you tried any of these sort of things uh in in uh, newton have do people use that sort of stuff to control yeah, the, the I mean, the, symptoms? I mean, given one of your products, a bit of plug there, Connor, uh, the VF8 did work, has worked for him and does, if he has a bout of it, it's that's, probably the chamomile. That's a good one. Yeah, that's And I do use Slip Real, I do use that. If, if I just feel like, because I say, I know with him because he gets really, he'll cough more and it, I can smell just a, a 
really bile smell on his breath. It's really strange how suddenly I can smell it. So slippery arm's really good for that. Um, but since the probiotics and since, you know, it, that really did calm it all down, sort of just doing that yeah. bit of gut healing. And I say, I think, I think the diet is, is important there with, with the, with the reflux issues That's um, cool. massively yeah. because yeah. I saw somebody with a Labrador that was panicking that she couldn't slow the dog down eating. And no matter what she did, she tried to feed him from the hand. He was getting, uh, he was getting stressed. He wanted more food. Mm -hmm. So she just started hiding little tiny pots of food with one meatball in it around the garden. And she'd put three out at a time, lock them behind the patio door, walk out, hide them around the garden. He comes out, tries to find them, but it means mm -hmm. he has to eat it and go off and find the next thing. Maybe it's an excitable way to do it, but I thought that was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. But like what these people, some of these people go through, in particularly with very bad cases, like it's uh, on the plus side that the, the operation was like 90 95 percent successful mm -hmm. like people were really happy with the operation it's just uh, it's a bit of a shock to the system that you now have this dog that you have to really change uh, a lot of stuff to to keep it regular but you are just uh proving the button there like that's if you do I it mean, you have a total can, yeah taking especially a labrador that eats everything taking them yeah. out like eating grass is so hard with him because they want to do it and you know yeah. i want to let him yeah. do it that is the one thing that i'm forever having because he'll just be like <laughs> And he can't swallow it, and I'm forever pulling it out. Of the <laughs> yeah. And it's pretty terrifying to be honest. Yeah. yeah. But um, it is it is difficult because he wants to eat everything. He finds God knows what on walks, and he wants to eat it. And um, I spend all my time literally making these meatballs and like yeah. not giving him this. And it's like I go out and it's just inhaling rabbit poo for the whole walk. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I mean, we're so lucky with him that he's pretty good. We've not had that many issues with him. With you know, sort of bringing up stuff or regurgitating stuff and we're so lucky so far in nearly three years he's had no incidents of aspiration yeah. pneumonia uh, which is obviously such a massive concern which is why you have to feed them the way you feed them because you yeah. don't want anything going down the wrong hole basically so yeah. um yeah. that's why we have to do it that way and, and it is for life you know for his life now that's how he has to eat people when you're out gonna give your dog a treat no it's like no yeah do not yeah, yeah. You'll kill the little crunchy <laughs> ones because i know yeah. he can't it's like he's, I've tried to give him yeah. rabbit ears, and if a bit breaks off, he's choking. I mean, most of the time he will cough it up, but he just, yeah. I don't need stress, yeah. quite honestly. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's such I a can't. worry. I can't help but think that the the um, in line with what we started off with, which is the surcharge for raw fed uh, vet, uh, pets in, in clinics, I can't help but worry that a conventional vet would never recommend. Uh, you know, fresh food for a dog with laryngeal paralysis because the thinking would be this food is so nuclear toxic that if it was to go down into the lungs, well, bloody hell, you're, you're going to kill him stone dead. In the belief that. that kibble doesn't have those issues, I mean, bloody hell, there's things on kibble you do not want in your lungs. Mycotoxin being the number one, and it's on every yeah. single product they test. I mean, it's rife because it's a cereal-based product, you know? It's a massive worry of, of a lot of people that, that have never fed raw. They'll say to me, aren't you worried about bacteria if it gets in his lungs? Or straight after surgery, they've got like an opening inside. Aren't you worried about the raw meat? In the... You just have to kind of explain the same thing. It's, you know, it's not it's not dangerous. It's not, it's got full, it's not full of bacteria that's going to yeah. go in their lung and, and kill yeah. them instantly, you know? Yeah, we've got, um, we've got a concern. Yeah, we've got, I mean, you can use cooked food for a while after these mega mm. operations and stuff. Though. You had a massive you know ate a whole heap of random bits and pieces as a typical cocker put spaniel pup so like you know you put you can give them a bit of cooked food for a while if you're worried but moving to fresh food it's good to hear that you do it is there many people like you that do uh, fresh feeding of these dogs karen or are you uh a quieter yeah. voice in the group on the on the land of your paralysis support group there's quite a few people that feed raw um oh. after a few years people go back to giving bones um you know it's it's just me personally i know that neuter will just gulp them down so i can't do it it's just yeah. every dog is so different um that i don't but there are quite a few yeah i mean there's there are that they're, yeah. they're definitely out there it's um i think it's very difficult when you've got a dog with this condition if you've only fed kibble and you they suffer terribly with reflux and things like that i think you're so terrified to change the way you do things because you're just so scared of that dog aspirating i mean i feel i know the feeling yeah. it's so scary to think your dog can aspirate yeah. and it'll be poorly i used to be terrified a bit but now I know with aspiration you've only just got to look out for certain signs like lethargy and if they go off their food, if they're coughing more. Like I, first thing I did when Newton got surgery was buy a thermometer because you just constantly, if they're off a little bit off, you just want to take the temperature, yeah. still have a fever and yeah. stuff like that. But um, now I know it's kind of like I look out for it and if you catch it early, it's it, it's not a death sentence. You yeah. know? Uh, for me, 
that's not as much of a death sentence as him suffocating to death like he yeah. did. Yeah. So yeah. it was yeah. it was kind of I mean the choice was taken away from us with surgery. He had to have it because yeah. it was an emergency. But yeah. um, I would always say to someone if you can get it done earlier rather than because it will progress and like me and it just came on so quickly. Yeah. Um, he was just collapsed, you know, and by then his heart was weaker because of the lack of oxygen for so long. So uh, people, surgery can be really scary, and I understand that you won't find anyone that was more terrified of it than me. Yeah. Um, I mean, I contemplated, should we do it or should we just end it for him? That's how scared yeah. I was. But yeah. it was like, no, you know, we'll probably get six months out of him, and three years later, yeah. here he is yeah. still yeah. zooming. Yeah. Did, you ever, <laughs> did you ever do this operation, Bren? I mean, it must be terrifying the first time you have to do a dog's, get in there at a dog's, uh, you know, um, I can't get the word out. I was going to say voice box, but like get, get in at those bits and pieces. And like, how do you even practice that? Because I can't, I assume we practice on dead dogs, but like dead dogs wouldn't have, you wouldn't be able to do the same operation surely on a dead dog's shoulder. Is that, have you done this operation? Is it scary to do? Yeah, Tell us it is, it is very scary to do, you oh, know, yeah. um, but it oh, is, um, and, you know, it's just as I think somebody earlier mentioned, you know, some of the the cases uh, where you're dealing with, you know, long soft palates and laryngeal collapse and trying to deal with those brachycephalics. Um, and, you know, you have to be on it for their recovery because, you know, they they can get edema. That's inflammation following the uh, the surgery. Um, so, you know, some of these actually have to have, um, you know, an extra tube placed in through the trachea so that they can bypass the larynx whilst everything calms down. Um, uh, there are a lot of surgeons now that don't like to do that or don't want to keep them in or don't have the facilities to keep them in um, uh, overnight and therefore they will try them at home and uh, it's it's looking at the appropriate practice that can now you know keep an eye on them for sometimes even two to three days post-surgery to make sure that they've made a full recovery that all the inflammation has gone down um, and that they can cope um, back in their home environment um, and you know uh, I think so many people will have found tonight so helpful from you, Karen, of having experience of how to deal with those patients, um, you know, from the horse's mouth, so to speak, in the sense of, you know, knowing what what has worked for your individual case and there are some groups out there are you part of those karen as well have you yeah the, the one i'm on is the laryngeal paralysis support group on facebook and they they are amazing they really are and i just wanted to say one thing because a lot of people ask it on there when people come on and they've got a dog that's suspected laryngeal paralysis unfortunately there are quite a lot of vets that don't know a lot about it and they'll just say oh you don't want to do the surgery it's such a big risk all I'd say to those people is insist that you get referred to a board certified soft tissue specialist because they're mm. the ones that do this every day. Like my our surgeon was like, it takes me 20 minutes. It's the easiest thing in the world because she knows the anatomy, like the back of her hand. If you see those people, they put your mind at ease. I mean, we were so lucky with our vet that he was just like, have the surgery. It's amazing. Do it. I'll refer you. Um, so we were very lucky, but I think a lot of people get really, really scared by their sort of their own vet who may not know enough and just says, oh, yeah. no, you don't want to do that. The rest of their life, you've got to feed them this way and that. But soft tissue, I mean, our surgeon was just so laid back. She was like, he's fine, just go live your life. You know, she didn't, she was like, yeah, you can do meatballs if you want. That's you don't have to. Here. Just, yeah. It's, you know, it's totally different to someone that, fair enough, doesn't have the experience. They're yeah. not going to obviously um, feel the same. But um, that's all I would say to people because I see that a lot on the group. Oh, my vet didn't recommend it. And sometimes, like with Newton, he had such weak back legs before his surgery, and that can be a reason a vet will say, don't have the surgery, they're too weak, their back legs have gone, the, the polyneuropathy is set in already. But it's like Newton had it, and within like four or six months, he had massive muscles in his back legs because of the oxygen had come back. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that's all I'd say to people is don't kind of be put okay. off. Just go and see that board certified specialist, you know, the soft tissue surgeon, and get yeah. their opinion. That's really, really important. That's cool. Car I want to say thanks so much for coming in tonight. That, that's a, that's a great story. Uh, and it's, it's actually a bit of a kick in the arse a little bit to say, Jesus, could I perform CPR on a dog? I really don't think so. I've seen a few videos. I missed my CPR course one uh, because of the birth of my kid. And so like, I need to sharpen up a bit. So if that alone is the thing that we that mm -hmm. we kind of enthuse on people today, so that's, isn't that good news? Uh, to even start with a YouTube video, but guys, get yourself booked into a course. It's so easy. And uh, if it's not your dog, it could be somebody else's. I can't help but think, just part, parting thoughts, 
spot for me, and I'm uh, everyone can have them have a go. But this is mine. Um, an awful lot of this disease that we're seeing in dogs is idiopathic. They can't pin it down when they look and see. Is it? Is it? Uh, most of them do believe that it's, there's a physical trauma is definitely a, a major factor, but they can't pin it down. And when they test it, uh, the people at the top that are looking at this all the time, you shared me with, with me a brilliant um, scientist, uh, Karen, I can't remember the lady's name, but she's she knows more about this than anybody. And mm -hmm. she can't give us a definite answer of all the causes of this. I just want to direct people to this TED Talk. Check it out on YouTube. It's called, I did my research, blew the whistle, and found myself at war. Okay, I did my research, blew the whistle, and found myself at war. Check out that TED talk on uh, YouTube, and you tell me what um, what uh, after that. It's it's very very interesting it's about megasophocus and dogs and what one vet tried to um, tell the world about and the cause of it. And you won't be surprised what it is because I'm smiling and I'm happy. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I believe there's something there because they don't know why it was kicking off the nerves in this instance, uh, and they don't know why it's happening here. But although. Brian has made a very, very good case for uh, physical trauma and damage to nerves and whatnot, and I'm totally convinced, as I always am, Brian, when I don't know something and I come into one of these things. You always do the job. For me. It takes a while though; it takes the 45 minutes. Uh, so, uh, yeah. What I'm going to do is just convince Connor every week, and then I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm made up. What am I going? What do I want to, have to, have to learn about next week? You know, <laughs> wormholes. Uh, like, are they a thing? <laughs> Quantum physics. Uh, That's what we're doing yeah. next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not coming. On for that one, I'm not coming. On for that one. <laughs> yeah, I'll be missing as well. I'll be good, um, thanks. Yeah, listen, uh, oh. thanks very much, guys. I've got a dash, I've got a, I've got yeah, a yeah. Yes. And, and thank you so program. much, Karen. Um, uh, if any of you want to see pictures of Nick's holiday, uh, then <laughs> speak to Connor. I'm not posting anything, uh, because <laughs> I'm away in May and I don't dare think what they might post in those circumstances. So, <laughs> so that's you, Connor. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make money out of it somehow. We'll basically get back anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Take care, guys. Thanks, guys. It's Thanks always a lot. great. And